Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Neon Kev. Today on the channel we're going to be doing a repair on this Agilent E8257C PSG analog signal generator. This PSG is from Altest Instruments, who are a major reseller for all things test and measurement right here in New Jersey. I personally picked up this unit from their warehouse, which houses tens of thousands of units, old and new, ready to ship. I definitely recommend checking them out for all of your equipment needs, link in the description below. Now, back to the video. The PSG signal generator is one of the longest running and best recognized signal generator products in the RF test industry. They have excellent phase noise characteristics and spurious response, so very good spectral purity. They do come in analog and vector uh, flavors, this one of course being an analog signal generator, meaning that it's capable with the correct options of generating amplitude, frequency, and phase modulations internally in the instrument. The vector series generators are the uh, E8267 models, also a part of the PSG family. And those include uh, baseband generators and the hardware necessary for vector modulation. So you can do things like QAM, uh, all kinds of digital modulation that you want to generate, including your own arbitrary uh, digital modulation formats. They do have the flexibility to generate custom digital mod as well. This generator is on the bench today. It's a C revision. And it apparently does, it does have one self-test error. And I'll go ahead and show you when I first received this instrument and uh, powered it on, I did run a self-test with the old firmware that was in there. It was firmware dated from 2003, which is probably the firmware that the instrument shipped with. So I hadn't had a firmware update in 20 years. I did test it with that firmware and do run a, self, a complete self-test on the instrument. And it generated two self-test errors. Okay, so the self-test finished running. Uh, we do have the 1204 error, which is the error that this instrument was reported to have. 45 passes, two fails. So let's look at the detailed test info. Now I'm seeing over here the first failed test is the 901 error, which is the ALC detector. And if we go over here and look at the detailed error messages, high band max out, low band max out. We'll have to uh, investigate these errors further, but it looks like the reported value was positive and the range for that value is supposed to be between minus two and zero. So we'll have to figure out what this error is. And the other error I believe was related to pulse, some sort of pulse mod error. Yeah, so the 1204 error is here. And that's related to the mid board specifically. But if we look at that error in detail, everything's good until we go to RF pulse on. And that's where the error is occurring. So everything else is fine. Now the instrument is cold still. I'm going to let it just run and uh, essentially do nothing for at least 30 minutes, maybe 45 minutes. Run the self test again and see if we get the same number of passes and fails and if the tests all, all are the same. So we'll let this instrument warm up a little bit more and we'll come back and rerun the self-test. Okay, so we've let the instrument warm up a little bit and ran the self-test again. We're seeing the same failures here. So if we go back to the top, we still have the uh, 901 error here. View the details. High band max out, so that's still failing. We go down here and our 1204 error, RF pulse on, that's also failing self-test, everything else is fine. So what I'm going to do now before I go ahead and take this instrument apart is two things. I'm going to try to view the RF output, connect a spectrum analyzer to the output and see what's coming out. And then the next thing I'm going to do is clean this instrument and it's got some physical dent and scratch. I think the most, uh, the most concerning physical damage on this instrument is that the type N connector is actually bent quite severely. You can't see it from this angle. So let me reposition. All right. So you can see, um, looking at the side of the unit here, just how bent the front panel connector is. So 
We're going to have to make sure that none of the uh, external threads on that type N are damaged. And then also clean that connector before we go ahead and mate anything to it. And I'll show you my process for cleaning microwave connectors like this safely. So one thing to know and always respect about this process is that the input could very well be static sensitive and most of the time it is. So you really want to be careful, always wear your wrist strap, work in a static safe environment. And the only cleaning uh, solution we're going to use is 99.9% .9 reagent and grade isopropyl alcohol. And I have that in two containers here, a, a needle applicator, and then I also have just a little pump bottle here. And the cleaning implements I use, Kim wipes, of course, and then these little foam tip sponges here, like swabs, sponges, and make sure they have a nice cushiony foam tip. I don't like to use Q-tips because the tips are round and that cloth material will actually break up and get stuck in certain places. This is not fibrous at all. It's a foam and it has a rectangular shape. So it's actually very good for getting around that center conductor. So the first thing we're going to do, I have not touched this connector yet. I like to move the instrument so that I can hang it over the edge of the table and uh, I can get access to the bottom. So let me just scooch this forward a little bit. A little bit more. Okay. Make sure our camera is still in shot here. So what I'm going to do now is just put some isopropyl on the Kim wipe and start by just dousing the outside. And then really kind of focusing on the threads, of course, because that's where most of the contaminant on the outside is going to be. You can see that coming off on the rag already. Okay, so now that I'm pretty confident that the outside is relatively clean. I'm going to ha go ahead and use my needle applicator here to carefully apply some alcohol inside of this connector. So I'm going to drip it over the center conductor and it's also going to fall around the inside of the barrel of the connector. And then uh, to start, I can start with a piece of Kim wipe and just kind of swap the inside, uh, not forcing it in because you don't want to damage the center conductor, but just kind of swab the inside lip that's closest to you because you do get a lot of uh, debris and dirt in that, in that immediate area where the center of the mating plane is. And now to get deeper inside of this connector, that's when I use the swab. So you use a nice rectangular swab, you apply some alcohol to the swab too. You just go ahead and carefully work your way around the center conductor. So you're cleaning the outside of the center conductor and the inside of the outer conductor. One thing to note, um, this connector specifically is an air dielectric type N connector. So um, that's done, of course, because you do have better microwave characteristics using an air dielectric as opposed to something like PTFE. But one thing you want to be careful of is uh, in order to make this an air dielectric, there actually is um, a, a small suspension framework to hold the center conductor, of course. That's not PTFE. It's another material or it could be actually a, a low reflection plastic. But uh, the bottom line is it's not like the center conductor is encapsulated in a rigid body of PTFE. So you don't wanna go ahead and jam this in there aggressively. Just be very careful. You know, don't over insert the foam swab. Just swab up onto the inner, there actually is an inner shelf in this conductor, which is before uh, the, the center conductor support. And that's where I'm stopping. So I'm not, I don't need to jam this all the way in there. And you really just need to clean that part of the connector um, because that's where the, you know, microwave interface really is between the center conductor and the inside of the outer conductor here. 
So once I'm done swabbing there, I'll just apply some more alcohol on the outside, uh, especially around the threads. Around the inside, drip some over the center conductor. Because notice that the male pin, when it goes into the female contact here, um, I have not actually swabbed or mechanically scrubbed that area. I've scrubbed everything else on the outside and the inside. So to clean that area, um, you could, tr I, I suppose you could try using, uh, you know, something mechanical to do it. I would not recommend that. Um, you know, I would just get the inside as clean as possible and make sure there's plenty of alcohol. And then uh, to get rid of any debris that might be suspended in the alcohol, I'll use an air blower like this. So this is a Metrovac ESD duster. And I've used this thing so much, I've actually broken the cord off of it and had to repair that. But the bottom line is if you don't have one of these, get it because this is an excellent, excellent tool uh, if you don't have an air compressor or you don't want to use canned air. So I take this and I hook it up to my programmable AC power supply because I don't need it at a full 120 volts. Uh, it's actually very strong. So I'll just throttle it down to about 40 volts and go ahead and blow air across the plane of this connector. So not straight in again, but kind of across. And then I'll just apply a little bit more alcohol and do that again. And that's all you really have to do to get a connector like that clean. So now that I'm confident that it's clean, I'll just inspect the threads one more time because I know this connector was hit at some point and that's why it's bent. I'll, uh, I'll inspect the connector again to make sure it's safe to thread on uh, my adapter and then we'll hook it up to a spec and and see what the output of the signal generator looks like all right so now we've got the spectrum analyzer connected to our signal generator uh the spec and i'm using here is an n9344 c goes up to 20 gigs so we should have the full frequency coverage for this psg so right now we're at one gig zero dbm on the signal gen uh, rf is off right now I made sure all my connections are good. And I know these adapters and cables, everything is fine. I've used them before. And what I'm gonna do is turn the RF output on. And it is very tiny. So this is minus five dBm here, this line. So our reference level is five dBm at the top of the chart. And you can see, we do have a signal approximately at one gigahertz here, but it is quite small. So if I do a peak search, uh, right now the noise at the 20 gigahertz end of the spectrum is actually higher than this peak. So um, maybe I have to increase the power a little bit on the signal generator here. And now we're starting to see the peak. So I'm set to 10 dBm now on the signal gen and on the analyzer, I'm seeing minus 20. So this could be a lot of things. It could be that RF path error we saw. Um, this unit does have the step attenuator and the step attenuators can also be an issue with these uh, units with any uh, RF instrument, especially Agilent Keysight models. Um, I've done more attenuators than I care to admit in these units and they have an these tiny little O-rings on each plunger that always fail. So it could be an attenuator issue. It could be related to the 1204 error that we're seeing in a self-test. Let's just uh, go up in frequency a little bit and see if we see any unlocks or on levels or anything else going on. You know, the, the generator isn't reporting an unlevel, even though our power is really low. Now it could be uh, a damage semi-rigid cable inside of the unit from when this front panel connector was impacted. Uh, it could be a lot of things. The power seems to be pretty flat though. Um, it's around minus 20 dBm. 
uh, for the same setting, power setting on the signal generator. But we appear to have frequencies, at least in the low band so far, 6 gigahertz, 7, 8, 9, 10, still around minus 20 to 23 dBm. And, you know, of course, we have a little bit of loss in the cables and adapters, even though these are pretty good. Uh, the adapters are rated up to 18 gig and the cable is rated up to 26 and a half gig. So we are going to lose a little bit of power in our cables and adapters, but it does seem like the power is relatively flat. Keep going up in frequency here. 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Yep, so it looks like the power is pretty flat from 1 gig to 20 gig. And it's just down by about 30 dBm. So we're definitely going to have to investigate that. I don't think it's, uh, you know, it's any part of my setup here. It could be, I'm guessing, either the attenuator or possibly a damaged uh, semi-rigid cable uh, from the front panel connector being bent. At such an angle, but it could also be related to uh, to the 1204 RF path error that we're seeing. Uh, the only way to find out is to open it up and start fixing. So before I do that, I'm going to take this unit and clean it. Um, so I, whenever I touch it, I don't get sticker residue and schmutz all over my hands. And I'll show you that process. It's not really exciting, but I'll show it anyway, um, just for thoroughness. And we'll come back to the lab when that's done. All right, so here's a bird's eye view with the cover moved. We have four boards here, which are clad in RF shielding. And these are mixed signal boards. These contain both RF and digital circuitry. You have the sampler, the frac N, the reference board, and then the low band output board. And then you have a few unshielded boards here. And these are primarily digital and control boards. So we have the YIG driver here. This is responsible for controlling the fundamental signal source in this instrument, which is a 3.2 to 10 gigahertz YIG to an oscillator. So this is the board that provides the current and the control for the YIG. Then we have the ALC board. So this board is responsible for um, amplitude leveling, whether you're using the internal ALC or not. And then finally, we have the uh, modulation board here. So this does the AM, FM, and phase modulation and pulse modulation, which are all options for this unit. Then, of course, in the back here, we just have our CPU. So this is the uh, the brain of the unit, uh, provides general purpose control, runs the firmware, and then our power supply. And on the inside here, you can't see it from this camera angle, but we just have a what's called the mid deck, which drives the RF microcircuits. So if I go ahead and turn the unit over. You can see over here, we have uh, two RF microcircuit uh, assemblies here. So um, these are responsible for the higher frequency bands of the unit. 
And then this is just the uh, back plane uh, of the motherboard. So uh, these are where all the cards uh, attach. And then you have uh, various coax cables for different uh, RF signals traveling between the boards. And up here, this is the, uh, this is the YIG-2 oscillator itself. So that's the fundamental signal source for the RF output. And then this option has the, this unit has a step attenuator option here. So you can see that. And yeah, fan, rear panel board, and that's really all there is to it. So in order to begin troubleshooting this unit, the first thing I'm going to do is drop the front panel. And that's gonna be a little tricky with this bent uh, output connector, but this is also the reason I'm doing it because I wanna make sure that this connector is not damaged on the inside uh, where it does connect to the semi-rigid coax for the rest of the instrument. So I'm gonna make sure that this is not damaged, um, the connector itself, and then we can work our way backwards uh, from the microwave front end so we can test the attenuator out of the instrument and then check the, the levels and all the signals uh, as we work our way back. And we'll see if indeed that low amplitude symptom we're seeing is a result of this or something else going on internally. So one thing I'm gonna do before we get started with the uh, repair work is to replace the internal battery of the instrument. Every time I power cycle the instrument, it does show errors related to uh, file system issues and those stem of course from the internal battery being completely dead as you can see here it's pretty much flat i mean <laughs> it's it's dead so we're going to throw a fresh battery in there and that'll avoid some of the extraneous errors that we're seeing every time we turn the instrument on and it's something that has to be done anyway so why not just get it over with so dropping the front panel on the PSG is a little bit of a fiddly process. You have a number of screws on different sides of the instrument, and then you need to carefully slide it off of the chassis and the main RF connector, while being careful not to apply too much stress to the digital connectors going to the front panel. So it's a little bit of work, but uh, patience is the key. So in order to completely separate the front panel from the instrument, there are a number of cables that need to be removed from the inside coaxial cables that connect to various boards. So just got to take your time here and separate everything and then uh, unplug the digital connectors as well. Make sure you label everything so you can put it back together in the correct order. And then uh, we can get the front panel out of the way so we can assess the mechanical damage to the, to the front panel connector itself and begin to make that repair. All right, so just showing some details here on the front panel RF connector assembly. We have the connector itself and the mounting bracket that holds it to the chassis. You can already see uh, how it's bent out of shape here. And then if we look on the inside, you can see the semi-rigid cable that connects straight to the attenuator. So what we can do now that we have access here is to begin breaking this assembly down and testing the individual components to see if that has anything to do with our loss of amplitude at the output of the instrument or if we need to look further. Okay, so here are the first few bits that we removed that could be responsible for the uh, low amplitude output. We have the step attenuator option, the semi-rigid cables that go from the output directional coupler to the attenuator, and then through the attenuator to the output connector on the front panel. And you can see the bracket is definitely bent here, so we can fix that. And this is just a uh, PTFE type SMA connector. It's not a precision uh, a uh, air dielectric or 3.5 millimeter connector. So um, you can see that it does look like an air dielectric connector from the outside of the instrument, but I suppose uh, that using PTFE and just regular SMA on the inside is not an issue. That uh, the loss at 20 gigahertz probably isn't that substantial. 
So while I'm straightening out this front panel connector, I also noticed that it had a bit of corrosion on it. So I went ahead and dunked all the mechanical pieces into a rust removing solution first. And my rust removing solution actually removed what was left of the zinc plating on the, on the main RF connector bracket. So what I'm gonna do is uh, also straighten that bracket out first and then clean it up and plate it with a uh, nickel plating solution that I already had left over from another project. So just to put a nice finish on there and prevent it from becoming corroded in the future. All right, so now that we've dealt with the mechanical issue with the damaged front panel connector, uh, we can move on to the RF testing of the instrument and beginning to troubleshoot the uh, actual problem that it has. So uh, this is my test setup here, and this will allow me to power on and test the instrument and different points within the instrument. So while the front panel is disconnected, this actually makes my job a little bit easier. Um, you can see that it's not mechanically screwed into the chassis. I just have the digital connections hooked up here so that we can operate the instrument. We don't need any of these coax cables connected. These are all of the uh, BNCs on the front for uh, different inputs and ALC and you have the pulse generator connections here. So we don't need that uh, just to do the testing that we need to do to troubleshoot. And you can see uh, the attenuator is out of the instrument but the uh, attenuator control voltages are still connected. So it's still connected internally to the mid deck here. And what this can allow me to do is test the attenuator outside of the instrument with a separate, uh, with a separate device. And for that, I'm using this Anritsu MS2721B because it has an internal tracking generator. You can see that the Anritsu is hooked up to the attenuator and I'm only testing uh, up to three gig here. Obviously this is a 50 gig attenuator, but what I'm interested in is knowing if the attenuator is faulty in any major way. That is if the O-rings or the steps have deteriorated that, um, you know, the through path of the attenuator would be affected at all frequencies and not just, you know, at one frequency or another. So I, I want to test the individual steps of the instrument's attenuator uh, using this instrument here. And then I've also got uh, the other spectrum analyzer connected directly to the high band directional coupler here, which is also um, where the RF output would then go into the attenuator and then into the front panel uh, connector here. So by testing it at this point, I'm ruling out uh, any issues with the front panel connectors and the attenuator. And I'm just evaluating the signal level uh, as it should be before the attenuator. And obviously at higher power levels, uh, the attenuator is completely switched out of the RF path. So uh, at higher power levels, if we have incorrect power measurements here, it means that something uh, downstream of the attenuator is causing the issue. And as you can see right now, I've got the instrument set to one gigahertz and 10 dBm uh, CW, no modulation. And 10 dBm is high enough that uh, the attenuator is switched completely to the through path. So there's no attenuation. And if we come over here and look at our output on the spectrum analyzer, indeed, it is still minus 20 dBm low. So we're going to have to troubleshoot. And the first place I'm going to start is with this detector and uh, directional coupler combination here. So that's, that could be one thing that's causing the, uh, you know, the ALC not to regulate correctly and for the amplitude to be low. And uh, we'll just work our way back, uh, back from the RF path there. So now I'm going to go ahead and step over to the front panel here. And our amplitude is still set at 10 dBm where it was built before. And you can see if I increase the amplitude here, this is a 1EA option instrument, which means that it has the high app output power option. And if I keep going up in amplitude here, you can see the signal level rise up to a maximum of the setting on the instrument is now 25 dBm. And you can see that our signal is still at six, uh, minus six dBm here. So it is indeed low, but the response does appear to be pretty linear. So when you go down one dB at a time, the amplitude does drop uh, at, at the correct uh, delta. It's just 
low for whatever reason. So we're going to have to investigate that error. And if I keep going down in amplitude, you'll see that the, uh, the signal level here, so right now the Enritsu is sweeping uh, continuously between 9K to 3 gig. And this is showing the, uh, the tracking gen uh, sweep results. So if I keep going down in amplitude, eventually we'll encounter the first attenuator step right there. So you can see that's minus 5 dB. And that step looks good. It seems to be tracking fairly linearly, and I don't believe there's anything wrong. I mean, of course, we're going to have this slight downward trend because as you go up in frequency, the, lo the system losses on all the cables and all the connections will increase uh, with respect to frequency. But we should expect a fairly flat response. I think the lowest frequency component here is RG316 that I'm using uh, in this setup. So that's really good to about 3 gig, which is why I've limited our sweep here. But we can keep going down in amplitude and make sure that the uh, response of the attenuator is linear, which it does appear to be. And of course, you can see on the instrument here how it actually... Um, interpolates between the different attenuator steps. So the output from the, from the microwave circuitry uh, is only subdividing on you know, small dB increments. And then once you switch in the next attenuator stage, the amplitude will actually shoot back up again over here. What's interesting to note is that um, I'm also seeing when I go down sufficiently in amplitude. So like right now, I'm at minus 50 dBm on the instrument. So we have uh, you know approximately minus 50 dBm uh, switched in here. The tracking gen is set to zero dBm output power. And if I keep going, you'll see that's minus 50, minus 51, two, but the output, drops pretty severely all of a sudden. It goes from minus 30 dBm, that's at minus 51 dBm setting on the instrument. I go down to minus 52 dBm and suddenly it drops another 10 dBm here. So that could definitely have something to do with uh, the ALC issues which are causing low amplitude in the first place. And you can see now the instrument set to minus 55 dBm. Minus 60, 65. So now we're getting pretty close to the noise floor um, here with our current bandwidth settings on the Enritsu. But you can see that the attenuator uh, appears to be working throughout all its steps. Uh, so we definitely have to trace our way back uh, beginning at this detector here uh, for the instrument. And um, we'll get into the architecture of the E8257C and try to figure out what exactly we should start measuring first. So here's the block diagram in the service manual for the analog PSG. This includes our instrument, the E8257C. Beginning at the RF output here, we have of course the output connector, which in our case is type N, and then we have the attenuator, which we already saw and removed from the instrument. And we saw that the low amplitude issue persisted even when the attenuator was not switched into the signal path. So we can rule out the attenuator as being the issue. Now, this brings us to the coupler detector here, but what we noticed was that this coupler detector specifically is between 2 and 20 gigahertz. There's actually a low band and a high band coupler detector in this instrument. So we noticed that the low amplitude issue also persisted below 2 gigahertz, which is the low frequency cutoff for this coupler detector pair. So before we begin investigating this too much, I, I hesitate to point fingers at the A24, A25 coupler detector because A, we don't have an on-level error message on the PSG, and B, because we, have, we still have issues below 2 gigahertz. Moving our way back from here, we can see that we have a high band path, which of course this instrument is not a 4 gig 
instrument, so it does not have the A27 doubler here. Instead, those two microcircuits we saw in the back were the A29 20 gigahertz doubler and the A30 modulation filter. Now, before we get into these, and these circuits, you know, these microcircuits are connectorized. We can look at the signals coming in and out of them. But instead of taking a, uh, a top-down approach here, beginning at the output, I elected instead to begin at where the signal source of the RF output begins, and that's at the A28 YIG. So now that I know that the front panel connector and the attenuator are no longer an issue, I'm just going to go ahead and reassemble all the hardware on the front panel and get the front panel back on the instrument. This will make it a lot easier for me to manipulate it and move it around. Uh, the PSG, as far as like the mechanical chassis goes, a lot of the rigidity does come from the front panel, so you don't want to really move it around a lot without having the front panel bolted on. So the E8257D is a YIG based synthesizer and what that means is that the signal source for the RF output is generated by a YIG tuned oscillator and that YIG tuned oscillator is this device here. So this little cylinder is the YIG and it tunes from a fundamental frequency between 3.2 to 10 gigahertz. So this PSG of course has a uh, has an analog bandwidth ranging from 100 kilohertz all the way to 20 gigahertz. And the way this instrument synthesizes those frequencies to the output is to take the output from the YIG, which can only tune between 3.2 to 10 gig, and for lower frequencies, it'll divide. For those intermediate frequencies, it will just filter the output of the YIG so it doesn't have to do any uh, fractional synthesis on the YIG unless you're in between uh, frequencies or, or smaller resolution steps, of course. And then for frequencies higher than 10 gigahertz that are you know, direct multiples of the, uh, the 10 gigahertz, you can uh, multiply and upconvert the output from the YIG. So this is where the signal begins in the instrument. And I think um, in order to go systematically and try to debunk where this low amplitude issue is coming from, because we've already ruled out the possibility of the output connector and the attenuator being problems because we measured directly at the output high band directional coupler and we saw that the signal was indeed low there. So we know that these uh, few mechanical components largely in the front end are not responsible for that. We probably have an electrical issue. Um, you know, it's, we're losing gain somewhere in the, uh, in the signal path. So we can start by tracing where the signal begins and try to isolate the block in the instrument where uh, we have that low gain, and then we can investigate further at a component level. So right now what I've done is uh, you can see the YIG here, and typically the YIG would have a jumper. So the first path that the YIG travels to, you can see this jumper that would usually be attached to the YIG the first place that the YIG uh, signal goes is into this module here. And what I've done is I've bypassed that with a fairly broadband directional coupler. So this coupler here is a Crytar model 1851. Um, it's a coupler that has a fairly flat uh, uh, coupling response between 500 megahertz to 18, 18 and a half gigahertz. And so the signal is passing out of the YIG to the input of the coupler and it, the through path of course is going to where the YIG would originally just go uh, normally in the instrument. But then we have a 10 dB coupled path here so I can view the signal that's coming out of the YIG directly. And the amplitude uh, of course, you know, depends on the coupling factor of the uh, directional coupler here. And for this model, uh, it has fairly flat 10 dB 
of coupling uh, all, throughout its entire frequency range, plus or minus one dB, according to the data sheet. So the signal we view on our spectrum analyzer here should be representative of what's coming out of the YIG up minus approximately 10 dB, because that's the loss from the coupling. And then, of course, we have another spectrum analyzer here attached to the output, so we can also, at the same time, change the frequency on the instrument view what the YIG is putting out and then what the output looks like as well, just to make sure that uh, everything is tracking. So let's take a look at our two spectrum analyzers as we change the frequency and amplitude on the instrument and see what happens. Okay, so let's take a look at our measurement setup here. We have two spectrum analyzers. The Spectrum Rider FPH here is attached to the RF output on the instrument and the N9344C is attached to the output of the coupler that is looking at the YIG signal. So right now the signal generator is set to 20 gigahertz and 25 dBm output. And you can see we do have our low amplitude symptom here. We have the correct frequency, approximately 20 gigahertz, but our amplitude is around minus 8 dBm. So this is the loss that we were seeing previously as well. And because the tuning range of the YIG inside of the PSG is between 3.2 to 10 gig. We see on the coupled signal from the YIG, we have a 10 gigahertz signal, and the, the, the analyzer here is measuring approximately 1.7 dBm. So add 10 dBm to that for the uh, coupling factor of the directional coupler, and we're looking at a signal, a YIG output of approximately 12 dBm, which is good. That is within specification uh, when you look at the PSG service manual. So I can actually go ahead and change the frequency here um, of the setting on the instrument, and you can see how the YIG uh, response will also change. So if we go to, for example, 19 gigahertz here, you can see that the YIG output has dropped by 500 megahertz, and it's still going through the double path. So 9.5 gigahertz times two, of course, is 19 gigahertz. We see that our amplitude is still uh, fairly level, it's still low at about minus 8.2 dBm, and the amplitude of the YIG over here uh, is a little bit higher actually, now it's around 3.6 dBm, but that's still within specification. Uh, the, the data sheet says the YIG output should be greater than or equal to at least 11 dBm approximately. So uh, as we go down in frequency, we can see that the response of the YIG is fairly linear. So we're just going in uh, one gigahertz steps down from 20 gig. So right now, um, the signal generator is set to 10 gigahertz. And of course, we would expect the gig just to be at 10 gigahertz. And uh, as we keep dropping down, yeah, everything looks fine here. Uh, four gigahertz, the gig appears to be fairly flat. You can see some harmonics poking up here. Uh, that's just due to the spectral purity of the gig itself. And um, as we go down, if we drop down now to three gigahertz, the YIG, the YIG frequency will actually increase. And now what the instrument's doing is dividing that fundamental. So uh, right now we're set to three gigahertz on the output of the PSG, but the YIG is tuned to six. And of course now it's dividing uh, the YIG by two. Two gigahertz here, eight gigahertz on the YIG, divide by four. So uh, you can see that the YIG is pretty, uh, is within specification. I don't think there's any problem with the uh, YIG oscillator itself. So let's keep moving forward in the signal path of the instrument and see where we can find a signal that is low in amplitude that is outside of the specification in the service manual. Okay, so here's our second test setup. We've got our directional coupler again. And now we're looking at the output from J1 of the A2920 gigahertz doubler into the, I believe the sampler here. So according to the service manual, this signal should be between 3.2 to 10 gigahertz. It's directly coupled off of the YIG input and it should be greater than or equal to uh, minus seven dBm. And there is an amplifier inside of the 20 gigahertz doubler to boost the coupled signal. So let's see if that signal is within spec. So right now the signal generator is set to four gigahertz on the output here. And the output power setting is 
15 BBM. So I turned it down a little bit. And we're still seeing our low amplitude symptom here. So we have minus 15 dBm on the output. And the amplitude of that signal going from uh, the, 20, the 20 gig doubler to the sampler is looks correct. It sh should be greater than or equal to minus 7 dBm. Uh, we're seeing 4 gigahertz at on the analyzer here, minus 16 dBm approximately. Remember the coupling factor is 10 dBm for this uh, Krytar directional coupler. So we're seeing a signal level of about minus, uh, minus 6 dBm here. So that seems to be within spec. And uh, we can go up and down a frequency and just make sure the amplitude doesn't fall out of spec. But uh, I don't believe that is the issue. So we can keep sniffing around again and uh and check the other signal paths okay so here's our next test setup we're looking at the second coupled signal coming out of the 20 gigahertz doubler now it's a little tricky to uh shoehorn this directional coupler in there so you have to take your time and be careful not to bend any of the semi-rigid cable excessively so this signal is coming out of the uh, 20 gigahertz doubler going through the coupler here and then coming around into the frac end. And this is the, uh, the coupled signal of the YIG to the frac end. The amplitude again should be greater than or equal to at least minus seven dBm. So let's take a look at uh, what this signal looks like as we change the frequency. All right, so back to our two spectrum analyzers. I'll go over to the instrument here. Frequency. So we're at 8 gigahertz on the output now. And we're seeing uh, minus 12 dBm on the 9344C. So that's about minus 2 dBm uh, for that signal strength. So you'll see the same low amplitude here. Go down in frequency a little bit. 4 gigahertz, minus 13, so around minus 3 dBm. So that signal also looks pretty good. I don't see any problems with the uh, with the couplers or the... Uh, amplifiers for those coupled signals that are inside of the uh, 20 gigahertz doubler microcircuit. Um, you know, if, if those were an issue, that would be a pretty difficult repair because that's all wire bonded and um, it's not on the PCB itself. It's inside of this machine microcircuit cavity inside of that assembly. So it's a good thing that those are working. And the amplitudes look correct as well. So let's keep investigating. Now there's one signal that um, there are some other signals that we can poke around at. Unfortunately, in the service manual, uh, not all the amplitudes are specified for the RF signals between the blocks. So uh, while we can, of course, make our own measurement, uh, we won't have necessarily a, uh, a specification from Keysight to compare it to. So uh, let's go ahead and see what else we can deduce uh, by poking around inside this instrument. Okay, so here's our next test. What I'm doing here is I'm looking at the amplitude of the low band signal coming out of the low band output here. And normally this uh, cable would terminate into the low band coupler and detector, but I've bypassed that. So the output is going to the input of my directional coupler. Then the through path is going back into the low band coupler detector, but the coupled signal is coming out here and this is interesting. So the service manual says that the strength of this signal should be greater than 17 dBm or greater than 20 dBm for an option 1EA instrument, the high power output option, which this instrument does have. But you can see the coupled signal here. So we have our signal generator set to 3 gigahertz. You can see our coupled signal is only uh, measuring at minus 11 minus 12 dBm here, which means that uh, with the coupling factor, we're only seeing a signal that's around zero to minus one dBm. So uh, that's pretty interesting that the output power isn't, uh, isn't where it should be at the signal. And what I've done is I've set the, uh, the output, of course, to the maximum power. So we're up here at 25 dBm and you cannot go any higher in amplitude. So that is the limit. And 
If we try changing the frequency, for example, so we're at three gigahertz, which is the edge of where the signal should be. We can go down to like 2.9, for example. Two point eight, two point seven, two point six. You can see that the amplitude is level, but it's low. It's well below the point that it should be. And of course, uh, the output of the signal generator is correspondingly low as well. So, I'm gonna have to investigate uh, the A eight low band output board. And uh, maybe look at that gain stage. That might be uh, one of the issues we're seeing here. Um, it doesn't explain why the amplitude is still low in the high bands, though. So this would only be for signals below 3 gigahertz that are handled by the low band output board. So above uh, 3 gigahertz, of course, uh, those high band signals come through a different path. So we're going to have to investigate the uh, high band loss of amplitude. And it could possibly be... Um, that it's not the, the A8 board itself, but an ALC problem. And I would have uh, initially suspected that the uh, one of the couplers or detectors, because there are actually two. So the uh, for the low band, the coupler and detector are one module uh, that's in case there. But if you remember previously, um, there is, you can kind of see the high band uh, detector diode assembly there in the uh, detector bias board but for the high band there is another directional coupler that looks very much like this of course inside the instrument with a detector on the couple port and that's what does um that's what reports the instrument's output power level to the alc uh, above you know a few gigahertz and provides amplitude leveling that way for the for the output so uh, the issues that this instrument has, as you can see, even though the power is incorrect here, we don't have an unlevel error. And there are no unlevel errors as you change throughout the entire frequency range or uh, at different power settings. So if there were an unlevel error, I would go straight for the, uh, for the detectors here or the couplers. Uh, but I don't see that unlevel error. So I think that um, the instrument just might have a problem with, let's say, uh, the DACs that are responsible for the comparison voltage uh, that the couplers are generating. So the detectors uh, in the low band and high band both take the AC signal, rectify it to DC, and then that DC is compared to uh, an internal DC uh, signal level that's created by a DAC inside the instrument. And based on that comparison, uh, the instrument then knows what the relative power level is. And of course, when it's uh, calibrated and characterized at the factory, those DACs are trimmed so that, you know, when you set zero dBm at the output connector, you really are getting zero dBm and the instrument knows what those offsets are to compensate for all the paths internally. So I think that uh, based on these symptoms we're seeing here and the fact that there are no unlevel errors, this could very well be um, something that's going on on the a10 ALC board itself, and probably an analog problem uh, related to the DAX and the offset voltages that are used um, in the ALC uh, comparison measurements. So what I'm going to do is flip the unit over after disconnecting and reassembling everything. And then we'll take a look at the uh, A10 ALC board and try to understand how that works. So the A10 ALC board is the second unshielded board that sits behind the YIG driver. So here's the A10 ALC in the PSG block diagram. You can see that there are a number of signals coming in and out of this board, not only for the high band and low band internal detectors, but it also supports external detectors, as well as allowing for different types of bandwidth filtering for the ALC and for the ALC to also perform under different modulation conditions. What is of interest to me specifically on this ALC is the analog to digital converter here, which is responsible for quantizing the analog values that are coming from all the DACs as well as the detectors, and then allowing a comparison to be made between those values in order to determine what the power level of the instrument actually is. So you have the main ADC here, which is really the heart of the ALC, and then you have this uh, multiplexer, which allows you to switch in different signal paths, depending on what type of operation the instrument is performing. 
So again, uh, I think the, the core components that we really want to look at are the ADC and the DAX and then also any voltage references that may be on the ALC itself because those can also affect any offsets that could cause, for example, a low amplitude symptom. So here's a high res photo of the A10 ALC board. So the A10 ALC is pretty straightforward, especially compared to some of the other assemblies in this unit. One thing I wanted to do was to actually try to run this board in circuit while it was physically outside of the unit, because as you saw in the previous photos, it's not really accessible for test points and probing around while the board is inside the instrument. And I would have been able to do it as in making custom riser boards to plug into the unit and then with a ribbon cable run it out. I can show some pictures of stuff like this that I've done on the other boards in PSG signal generators and those are a lot easier to do because they have standard 2.54 millimeter headers and just a few coax connectors for the RF signals. For the ALC board here, they're using some strange amp connector. Well, it's not strange, but it's difficult to source. So I, have, I was not able to find these connectors anywhere. Because I'm not able to really probe this board easily, I decided to go with a sort of shotgun replacement method. So these are the majority of the parts I went ahead and replaced on the ALC outright. We have, of course, the main ADC, which is that LTC part. And then we have a couple of DACs surrounding that and op amps that are buffering the DACs and a couple of them boxes as well, just for good measure. The only other part that I ended up replacing in addition to those was the high stability 10 volt reference that was on the other side of the board. So after replacing all those parts on the ALC, we managed to clear one of the self-test errors. That was the 900 series error, if you recall, that had to do with the high band max out and low band max out. Those errors actually disappeared following this repair. So despite getting rid of the ALC related self-test errors, we still had the low amplitude issue and the 1204 error was still the only error occurring during the self-test. At this point, I'd become suspicious that the remaining issues with this instrument were not hardware related, but rather software related in relation to losing the calibration memory that the instrument had from the factory. So before sending this unit out for adjustment again, I'd made some final measurements on the ALC loop just to be sure that the internal detectors were not the issue. All the measurements I made seemed to line up with what was suggested in the service manual, so at this point I knew the instrument needed to be adjusted. The software needed to adjust most of these Agilent and Keysight boxes, especially RF instruments, is the Agilent Test Management Environment software. Now, early documentation for this shows no mention of licensing, but of course, uh, the N7800 TME software now on Keysight's website is all license-based. So there's no way to really do these adjustments yourself unless you were to purchase a very expensive license from Keysight. And even if you had the license for this software, you do require quite a bit of equipment to uh, perform these calibrations, of course, and instrument adjustments. So again, unless you had a standards lab with a pretty competent amount of hardware at your disposal, these kind of things are best left to Cal Labs or the OEMs themselves. So at this point, I was sort of inclined to just send the instrument to a, uh, a local Cal house. And the one I work with quite frequently is Custom Cal in Hamilton, New Jersey. So I called them up and had them take the instrument and they had the adjustment performed with the licensed Keysight software. And guess what? No more self-test error and the power is flat and level where it's set. So apparently all of that was needed was that little adjustment and the instruments working like new. Well, that just about wraps up this video. I had the unit sent straight back to all test after the calibration, so I didn't, of course, show the end result working, but I'm sure if it passed the full calibration over at Custom Cal, then the unit's functioning as it should. So don't forget to check out all test, and we've got a lot more equipment to take a look at in the future, so stay tuned. Thank you.